welcome uh, back uh, to the show. Former economics columnist for Harper's and the New York Times, regular contributor to the New York Review of Books and The Nation. He's a visiting professor of humanities at the Cooper Union and the director of the Bernard L. Schwartz Rediscovering Government Initiative, fellow at the Century Foundation, and found time to uh, author uh, multiple books, Jeff Madrick, uh, latest the Invisible Americans, Tragic Cost of Child Poverty. Uh, Jeff, uh, welcome to the program. Oh, we got a sound issue. Jeff, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Sorry, okay. you were uh, you were muted. Uh, welcome back to the program. I think it's been a, a couple of years since. Uh, yeah, we've I'm sure, but who can count? Uh, it's these been days, a eventful couple of years. Exactly. Um, uh, pretty appropriate uh, timing for this. I mean, obviously, I guess maybe part of the problem is that the 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 uh, the appropriateness of the timing for this has been sort of ongoing for um for yeah. for years and years and that is uh in many respects the problem let's let, let's start with this it's it's a broad question but it's an important one what is it that we don't understand do you think as a body politic as a society about child poverty well i the reason i did this book is i was shocked when i started to look at the data uh we have the highest child poverty rate among major rich nations basically the highest child poverty rate among any rich nation with one or two uh, minor exceptions and usually higher by far than any rich nation. The thing is I found in, in, in reporting and discussing this issue with people, they, they don't fully believe poor children, many don't even believe there are poor children in America. Now a poor child lives in a family of three, let's say that earns $21,000 a year, a family of four, 25 or 26. Those are the official poverty numbers and they vastly understate poverty. What I wanna say mostly about ch children in poverty is they suffer. They suffer for lack of opportunity. They suffer from the shame of being poor. They know they're poor, but they suffer mostly, maybe I shouldn't even say mostly, from being cognitively deprived they have less education, they have lower IQs. I, I have to say in the last 20 to 30 years, academic researchers have done extraordinary work trying to isolate the effects of poverty on these kids. Poverty causes reduced IQ. Poverty causes reduced educational attainment. And it continues on to adulthood. They work fewer hours. They make less money that is to say, young adults who grew up in poverty. So what I want, when you ask that question, and I want to emphasize, and I hope I've been doing it adequately, that these kids suffer. They are often in ill health. They know they are outsiders in a society. And we ask them to be responsible for themselves because we don't provide adequate aid to their parents. Uh, give us, I mean, a sense, is there a, um, and, and, and and what are we talking about in terms of numbers? Well, we're talking 10 to 20 million kids are, uh, are poor. The official, one of the great problems in America, and it reflects our attitudes towards the poor, which are pretty much that they, the poor are responsible for their own poverty. That's been historically true now for a couple hundred years, the general attitudes. The, the number, the measure of poverty in America is totally inadequate. At least 10 million are poor. Many of us, if we measured it correctly, it would be 20 million and even 30 million kids poor. That is the point at which deprivation sets in and affects future prospects. Okay, so when we, when we, when we say, um... Like, what is that? What What does it mean to be poor? Does that I mean, what is the definition? I mean, I understand the numbers, what we're talking about in terms of numbers. But in terms of practice, are we talking about um, you're skipping meals? You are um, there's 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 not proper uh, daycare, I guess, proper daycare, I guess, you know, uh, not or exactly any daycare. how we would define or any daycare. Yeah. So Let me go over that. I have I have a chapter in the book, Invisible Americans on this. The, the most telling problem for poor kids is that they are hungry. They may not be starving, 
in a traditional way, but some of them are. They get poor nutrition and they go hungry day after day. If they don't have access to federal uh, lunches in school and federal breakfasts, they are in trouble uh, nutritionally. When the pandemic hit, this was especially dangerous for them because they didn't have school lunches. So first, they're hungry. Secondly, they're often sick and don't get adequate attention. Uh, that's pretty serious. They can be born with uh, prenatal problems, postnatal problems. They, so they're often less healthy. They have inferior educations. They tend to go to school to schools that are underfunded in the states they're in. Uh, compared to other schools. And those schools usually have high proportions of poor kids. So they don't get to learn from other better off kids. They don't necessarily have enough clothes. Their parents don't necessarily have heat and electricity. There are all kinds of def deprivations and the deprivation levels are actually higher. The deprivation rates when you measure the kinds of things I just discussed than the poverty rate itself. They don't have much of a chance. And I just want to, I want to emphasize the point that they are ashamed. They know, as I said at the outset, they are poor. And when people make fun of their parents for buying them sneakers or iPhones, middle-class people just don't understand. These kids are not showing off. They just want to belong and they don't want to be ashamed. There is an attitude towards poor people in this country. Uh, and you, this is a world globally, actually, that, show, that, that disrespects the poor. It shows little respect for the poor. And my book, if anything, is about that, because I want to get, give unconditional cash allowances to parents of poor kids. Yeah, I want to I want to get to that uh, uh, that solution, but I want to talk about a couple of those other um, uh, things that you touched on here. We know. And I've seen different um, I've seen different measures of this, but we know that children living in poverty, when they enter into pre-K or K more often, I mean, now we have universal pre-K in New York City, for instance, but that is not uh, the typical uh, around the country. We know that when they enter kindergarten, they have a vocabulary deficit, a, like a, a, the number of words that they have been exposed to is dramatically less. I've seen, you know, various measures in the, in the tens of thousands um, that, that, that in terms of the range. But we know this basically because they have been given less um, real world experiences uh, because it costs money to have these experiences. They have less attention from adults because their parents uh, you know, maybe struggling to get by and maybe going out and trying to find work. Uh, maybe they are just sat in front of the TV because there, there isn't, uh, you know, uh, any money to, for, for daycare. So they start off behind the ball and that just continues through because so much is they don't, they're not getting supplemented in any way. That's uh, I do discuss the vocabulary issue in my book. That's one of many. It's one of the more dramatic uh, illustrations of the issue, but there are even more dramatic illustrations. Neurologists have pretty much confirmed that poor kids, zero to th deprived zero to three, certainly zero to six, literally have brain damage. Their brains do not develop as rapidly as their peers. The good news is if they are treated better later on, their, their brain, their gray matter can begin to be restored, but often they're simply not. So that's one example. The, there, there, are set, there are a couple of pathways that academics like to talk about. One is poor parents just don't have enough money to buy the goods, the food, the, the, uh, certainly the educational materials for these kids. The second issue is important though. Those poor parents, single parents or dual parents live under stress and they communicate that to the children. That's a big cause of the neural damage, the gray matter damage I've been discussing. So there are two pathways that this occurs and they're very well documented. This is not some fanciful bleeding heart idea. Yeah, I, I, you know, it, it escapes me now, and I think it must have been years ago that we uh, interviewed uh, someone who had done this research on, on stress. And it's, it's, it's incredibly 
disturbing. You know, I think they sort of like intuitively you think like, oh, well, if you're under stress as a kid, what you're learning is to build, uh, you know, a, a tolerance right. for stress. And it's actually <laughs> the opposite. It right. makes you more, uh, it, it debilitates your ability to deal with stress. And that's sort of like contrary to sort of the, I don't know, the, I guess maybe the, the typical, I don't know if it's the Puritan ethic or whatnot, you know, this whole notion of like, you know, how do you make uh, steel, you melt it and it comes back stronger. It's the opposite when it comes to human beings, apparently. Yeah. You, all you're Especially doing is working. diminishing their capacity. The, the uh, you know, there's a strong feeling in America that if you just work hard, even if you're poor, you'll get ahead. Some of that was a consequence of the post-depression years. The poverty was the characteristic for almost everybody in the depression. Then the economy grew partly because of war spending, but for a variety of reasons in the 50s and 60s, and the great middle class developed. People intuitively now feel, well, we just worked hard and we could get there. Then along came uh, publications in the early 60s that showed, hey, we did not conquer poverty. It was still 25% of the population. My Michael Carrington's book was the most noteworthy, the other American. And in fact, the tidbit, he actually understated the, the number of poor because he didn't think people would actually believe it when he wrote it in his book. Interesting phenomenon. We have a strong bias against thinking that uh, the, poor, uh, the poor are underprivileged. We tend to think, I think, some ugly things, that they don't work hard enough, that their parents pass on cultures, of, uh, cultures that are anti-educational, uh, but it simply doesn't, the, the facts just don't bear this out. They are deprived. The culture of poverty is one of the great myths of our time. Uh, one other uh, thing I wanted to note before we sort of uh, move on um, uh, is the uh, it, it, it sort of the 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 history and how we've addressed this and failed to address it um, is that notion of healthcare. One of the things I think that that COVID has also um, uh, laid bare in some respects. I mean, certainly the issue of of children getting meals at schools has been really clear, you know, with with the schools shut down. I mean, I don't yeah. I, I think I was aware of how many um, I, I don't think I was aware of just how many kids rely on the New York City schools, for instance, for lunch. We have a couple almost uh, over 100,000. I think it could be around 140,000 homeless children who look to lunch at school, but the numbers of, of, of students who, who uh, rely on school for a school lunch uh, is, is huge. And, and New York, to its credit, also um, made uh, school lunch free for everybody. So that stigma that you were talking about, and I wanna get back to that as well, was reduced. But one of the things that also became clear with COVID is that we had an assault on public hospitals in this state. And we have a lot of data that shows uh, that your chances of dying were directly related to where you lived uh, and what you know and your uh, wealth uh, because there was just simply not the hospital facilities there and COVID reveals it in in the in the face of like you know what your chances are of dying in a pandemic but underlying that means that there's a whole deficit of health services that will be there for young kids which obviously, again, will have an impact through their lives. Well, let me say this, the, the expansion, Medicaid and the expansion of Medicaid, as well as the CHIP program, which is insurance program sponsored by Senator Kennedy, with whom I wrote a book, so I feel obliged to mention his name. And uh, uh, I'm the, the famed and rather right-wing Republican, sorry about that. Well, CHIP in any case, has provided insurance for a lot of children. A lot of children are covered by this and it showed improvement in their health. But you raise a significant issue. Number one, even if you're covered by insurance, parents can't always get to the doctor. Doctors, and I use doctors generically to, to, to uh, uh, dis, uh, meaning all health services. The health services are not always available, as you mentioned. So we have some serious, we have a serious healthcare problem. In fact, it's our, in my view, our health services industry is our biggest problem. 
we spend more, as you well know, you've probably covered this 50 or 100 times, but we spend more than any other nation per person. And for the most part, we have, with a few exceptional areas, have poorer outcomes. So uh, I think the COVID situation has shown this up to be what it is. But we should, I, I do want to note that we have made progress covering children with health insurance. All right. So let's talk about um, uh, the, 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 the cost of, of child poverty. Obviously, there's, you know, if we're, if we're not talking just in terms of humanity. There are some people who want uh, to know, is it cost effective <clears throat> for us to deal with child poverty? There's hidden costs associated with child poverty that, you know, beyond the human suffering, although personally, I sort of feel like that's where the conversation probably should end. But for others, they want to see, uh, you know, uh, that uh, what what's the cost effectiveness? I mean, do we have hidden costs associated with poverty to society that um, that are, are are not necessarily, I think, um, obvious to people. Well, Sam, um, uh, that's I think what bothers me the most. A nation that wor worries about its productivity, that is to say, its source of economic growth, allows, from my point of view, twenty to thirty percent of its ki its kids to founder cognitively disadvantaged. And the data show they work less when they get older, they don't work as well, they make fewer wages. Some economists and sociologists have put an estimate on how much we lose due to child poverty alone, due to lower productivity, due to poor health, meaning more social services, due to uh, uh, the, uh, uh, incarceration and the course, cost of incarceration, due to the need for more anti-poverty programs. It amounts roughly to $1 trillion a year. 5%. That's a pretty widely accepted number now. It was accepted by, the, by a broad uh, range of analysts from right to left who did a report for the National uh, uh, Academy of Sciences. So I think that states it most clearly. If we got child poverty down, we could have, don't call it a trillion, call it just half a trillion, two and a half percent of the economy. Two and a half percent of the economy is the amount the economy might grow in a year. And that just keeps building. It's pretty serious. It, it, and that's, you know, for folks, if, if just simply the, the sheer um, the desire to, to minimize uh, misery uh, isn't enough. Um, what let's talk about the but as you hint, it should be enough. <laughs> right. Right. Of course. But um, but it's also nice to know that this is a smart investment, uh, too, for people who are concerned about things like uh, like like productivity. What what are the things that we've done in the past to attempt to address? Them? I mean, you mentioned already uh, S chip. That was uh, Kennedy, as you said. And I think it was Orrin Hatch uh, was the uh, Republican uh, who who, who uh, co sponsored yeah. that bill. And uh, we also had the expansion of Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. That, of course, is in jeopardy now uh, because of the lawsuit that uh, the Trump administration is pursuing with the Supreme Court. And we will we will know more about that. Uh, in and they also want to attach work requirements to the parents. Who, who, uh, indeed, which, of course, makes it difficult because a lot of times people aren't working because they can't find a job. Um, there are no jobs. Exactly. And. So uh, aside from those uh, things that have materially impacted uh, child poverty, or at least the health uh, of children, um, what are the other things that we have done in an attempt to address it to the extent that we have? Um, and, and what has the, how uh, effective have they been? Since the 1990s or even the 1980s, our social policy has been jobs oriented earned income tax credit. You get benefits if you work. The more you make, the better the benefits for uh, up to a point. That has helped reduce child poverty, the earned income tax credit. It's been made more generous a few times. The child tax credit adopted, I think it was 1996, but my memory, as you noted with Orrin Hatcher, is starting to get dim. We're all there right now. Child tax credit now is $2,000. This is very important, $2,000 a year. And it only reaches, it re does not reach a third of kids fully because their parents don't make enough money. In my view, the, the beginning of this 
work dependent social welfare was in some sense the end of a decent America. We used to give people cash when they needed it. Now, not all those welfare programs worked very well, but they could have been tuned differently than to, uh, than to become work fair programs. So we have a $2,000 child tax credit that's been beneficial, but it does now. There is a bill it, that the House passed. You probably know about this. Of course, you know about the, the CARE and HEROES Act. And in the Senate, there's an American Family Act uh, sponsored by Sherrod Brown and, and, uh, and other senators. There we go. Um, <laughs> uh, which would expand the child tax credit from $2,000 to $3,000 and to $3,600 for kids under six and it would go to everybody. In other words, everyone would qualify and be sent money even if their parents made no money. In other words, before yeah. you only got paid as a tax credit against earnings. Well, well, That's a couple of examples. I think more is needed. I hope we'll get a chance to talk about that. Well, yes, we will in just a moment. But I just uh, w w just walk through this for us. If for, for people don't know what the earned income tax credit is and even what a tax credit is as opposed to a deduction. Because I think, you know, people hear these things and they don't know what it is. I mean, clearly the way that we have designed these programs is is the implication is you don't want to work. We're going to try and uh, convince you to work by making it a little bit more lucrative than it would be otherwise, which I mean, obviously has if I if I can find a job and I get the job and it makes it a little more lucrative, that helps. And as you said, it's had some impact. But the, one of the big problems is I can't find a job. And so the, it's contingent upon something I can't do and I get no benefits for that. But just explain to a, a, a totally a lay person about a tax credit, and then we'll talk about what your proposal is. So you get, a, if you make $500 a year, let's say if you make $25,000 a year, you have to pay ta federal income tax on that money. The earned income tax credit allows you to pay less tax on that money, depending on how much you are earning. Uh, so if you're way down at the bottom, it supplements the income you're earning because it's reducing your tax bill. It's an effective uh, remedy, but I don't think it's a great remedy for two reasons. One is you may not be able to get a job, but two, more important, you won't get a good paying job. The, bigger, the, the benefit is bigger if you make more money, the absolute dollars you will save because you would have paid more tax and the way it's structured, you get more of a credit. The same is true for child tax credit if you have children. It works the same way. It's dependent on your income. Um, so here's the thing. People began to like this in the 80s when they got disenchanted with welfare. Uh, partly the welfare system wasn't working, but it wasn't working as badly as the anti-welfare people said. And Bill Clinton decided it's the end of the era of big government. One thing we're going to do is reform our welfare system and make it based on work. That was an example. But the earned income tax credit, he also expanded in those years, which was valuable. I don't think it's perfect, though. The social welfare money in America used to go in greater uh, percentage to those who made below the poverty line. Now that's been reduced. There are Hillary Hans and other scholars show that quite clearly. Uh, Robert Moffat, it's very clear. The reason is we depend on these earned income tax credits rather than depending on actual welfare programs. Right, and a lot of people, um, 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 me amongst them, has been very critical of that uh, welfare reform during the Clinton years, because as soon as jobs, um, uh, the, the jobs available contracted, many people, the number of extreme poor increased as a result of people living in extreme, what they call extreme poverty, increased as a result of those, you know, so-called reforms that uh, Newt Gingrich was all, all excited about. Um, you basically only have two welfare programs, the food stamps and TANF, which is very limited and doesn't reach very poor people. So let's talk about your, um, your, uh, your plan. It's very straightforward. And uh, we should also say, in this era of COVID, there is data coming out of COVID, the first CARES Act that went out, 
that in many respects sort of like, you know, gives you all the evidence you need that your prescription is the right one. Let yeah. T- talk about this. Well, my prescription comes from a couple of places uh, in my head and heart, forgive me. Um, one is we can't keep treating poor people like they, poor parents like they can't take care of their kids. If the big, the big reason we don't want to give cash is that we think they're going to waste the money on themselves. The evidence is that they don't. It's not only evidence in the U.S. Almost all rich democracies give a cash allowance of some kind or other. Canada, we do, in my uh, think tank, which is part of the, uh, supported by Bernard L. Schwartz, we presented uh, the Canadian proposal and talked about how much it would help America if we adopted the Canadian cash proposal. So my, my attitude was, my attitude is simple. Kids need, poor kids need a lot of things, but mostly they need money. And I'm not just, this is not just wishful thinking. One of the things discovered by academics over the last 20 years is the value of money itself. They're in constant, I talk about this, I think I have a chapter in the book that talks about how money matters. The one colorful example is an Indian tribe that, that uh, developed a very successful casino and they gave $5,000 to each family that had a child. The this evidence is, this is, is a Duke study from a, a Cherokee tribe in North Carolina. Is that right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And they discovered they, they, uh, they, their educational attainment increased. The crime rate decreased. That is compared to their peers in similar tribes and in similar economic circumstances. But that was just, but that was but one example of how cash can matter. So my view is, Let's give them cash, three or four thousand dollars per child a year, maybe five thousand dollars. Some nations go higher than that. And let the parents figure out how to use that cash best. Buying them a warm coat, having electricity in the wintertime, and buying them uh, uh, um, buying them books, computers, possibly, at least an internet service. And let's treat parents in a way, in a respectful way. And I think they'll act in a respectful way if we do that. Well, we know from the COVID payments that were uh, sent out at the beginning of uh, the crisis, back when um, uh, you know there was uh, at least um, some attempt to provide relief for Americans. We know that the the, the cash payments ended up reducing the poverty rate. I mean, in a way that I mean, it just it. it I mean, it it sounds. Uh, quite obvious, but uh, all the data was there. Um, and the other thing is, we also know sort of ideologically, we keep hearing that, you know, you want to localize, um, uh, you, you know, you want to give school boards uh, the right to expend their own cash. Well, this is, this is that, 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 that principle, but on a, um, a very meaningful level. And that is, let parents trust parents of children to figure it out. Of course, uh, on the margins of every single endeavor that humans uh, uh, t- undertake. I think there's, you know, people who don't do the right thing or they they uh, waste it or whatever it is. But the bulk uh, is important. Now, you're, what you're proposing is also universal, right? I mean, so universal and taxable. So that taxable. if you make higher incomes, it'll be taxed away. The universality is a little bit like social security is universal. You want to have everybody you want to have broad public support for this kind of thing. And but let me also say that giving them cash, you raised a good point, Sam, giving them cash got poverty down. But now we know getting poverty down gives these kids a chance in school to get good jobs, to be healthy, to be emotionally stable, on and on and not to have brain damage. Let me just lastly just add this thing about the universality. You know, people are always talking about means testing, whatnot. We have a way of means testing. That is very efficient. This also applies to Social Security for that matter, which is you give everyone a universal amount and you claw it back on the back end with taxes because we already have an apparatus to determine you know, taxes. We already have a tax rate. We don't need to create another bureaucracy to see and to force people to jump through hoops to get it in the first place. We could just do it on the back end through taxes. It's the most efficient way. And it also retains support for this program so people aren't thinking that other people are getting benefits that they're not getting. Of course, I'd love to raise the progressive tax rate 
as well. So. You and I both. <laughs> we can do that as well after we get uh, after we do the heavy lifting of of getting those payments out. Uh, Jeff Madrick, the uh, book is Invisible Americans: Tragic Cost of Child Poverty. We'll put a link uh, to that book at Majority.fm. Thank you. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate. And it. remember, Sam, it's not the kids' fault that they're poor. Indeed. So let's not blame them. Indeed. Thank you, Jeff. Really appreciate it.